Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of March 11th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the Weekly Top 3 also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, We explain why it is time to have a serious discussion about revenue approaches, because even the Republicans have given up on spending cuts. Second, we discuss how we are sliding backward into Representative Zach Field's vision of the future. And third, we discuss what DOR's spring revenue forecast is likely to tell us and what that means for the budget going forward. And now, let's join Michael. Let's get cracking, shall we? You got uh, you got quite a list of things to talk about, and um, it's. I mean, I'll be honest with you. The, the part when I say depressive, it's only because there is so much truth in it. And we start off with number one, which is the republic. Even the Republicans have given up on spending cuts, and it's just there's. There's no, there's just there's nothing else. So, I mean, now we have to have this conversation about who pays, right? Because they've just totally given up. They've thrown their hands up in the air and circled the wagons, shot inward and said, oh, we, we did all we could do. Sorry. And that's it. I mean, it's just kind of where I feel like we're at. Well, it's it's that's a, a fairly accurate uh, uh, summation of, of where we are. So the, the House Republicans, the House Finance Committee, uh, has uh, all of the subcommittees that that do the the work on the on the budget have reported up, um, and out of a um, let's see, out of a total uh, of in the governor's amended budget operating budget of three point one five billion dollars, that's the total uh, operating budget that the House Finance Subcommittees uh, 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 take a take a look at. Out of that total 3.15, well, to be accurate, $3.155 billion, $3 billion, 155 million. Out of that total, the House Finance Committees have recommended a total cut of $5 million. <laughs> so they've, they've moved, they've moved the, the, uh, the, the, the total spending, they've recommended total spending be reduced from 3.155 uh, Three billion one hundred fifty-five million dollars to three hundred, three billion one hundred fifty million dollars. That's boy, it. That was, boy, man, there's some real heavy lifts going on there. I could just tell there's some <laughs> heavy, heavy. What is that, Brad? I'm no mathematician, but that's got to be point zero zero something, right? I mean, yeah, it does. It doesn't make it to one. It doesn't make it to one percent. Um, fifty, fifty. Well, three hundred thirty million dollars. Three hundred billion dollars to make it to ten. It makes it, it makes it a little bit over one percent. Um, but out of out of three point one five, it, may, it makes it a little bit over one percent. Um, that's composed of various things. For example, they did reduce the subcommittee on health, did reduce the proposed health spending uh, by nine uh, million dollars. But then, for example, the university subcommittee, the subcommittee that looks at the university spending, recommended an increase. Of ten million dollars, so the net net out of all of that is a five million dollar reduction. That's not going to close the budget or close the deficit. Uh, that's not going to to balance the budget. And and this is you know this isn't just this year. This is a number of years. 
that the Republicans have been in control of the House and they haven't been able to to uh, to, to find spending cuts to bring the budget uh, back into balance. At some point, Michael, we need to we need to face reality and say they're not going to do it. I mean, all of those people who are who are no doubt sitting on the other side of this screen now going spending cuts, spending cuts, spending cuts. All we need to do is cut spending to, to balance the budget. It's not going to happen. I mean, the, the, the House Republicans, uh, if anybody was ever going to do it, it would be the House Republicans. And they just haven't done it year after year after year. And this is another year of not having done it. Yes, theoretically, spending cuts could balance the budget. Of course they could. But the political reality is that they're not happening and they're not going to happen. Uh, if if we can't get more than a $5 million reduction out of a $3 billion budget, uh, they're not going to happen. So um, what, what does that mean? Well, it means that there's going to be some tax, some revenue that's needed to balance the budget. What they've done all of these past years is to balance the budget on the backs of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts, PFD taxes. And that's that's the way they balance the budget. And that's the way that Delena Johnson and others are talking about balancing the budget against again, uh, again this year. That's a tax. It's a tax on middle and lower income Alaska families. Um, it's taking money, diverting money that otherwise is headed toward their pockets out of their pockets over to government. It's the same as a withholding uh, that you that most of us have uh, in our uh, in our W twos uh, withheld for Social Security or withheld for uh, for income taxes. It's a withholding tax, um, and it is it is hitting middle and lower income Alaska families the hardest. The question we need to face up to, the question that that you know everybody wants to run away from by saying spending cuts, spending cuts, spending cuts. The question we need to face up to, is that the best way to raise the revenue? And ICER's told us all along that it has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy. Of all of the revenue options, it has the largest adverse impact on the overall economy, and it, and it has the, uh, and the toughest uh, uh, impact, the hardest impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. And it's not... You know, some people say, well, that revenue is going to pay for government. So it, so it's okay. It's not. What it's really doing is subsidizing the top 20% non-residents and oil. By paying taxes, the mid lower and middle income Alaska families are paying taxes that so that the top 20% non-residents and oil companies don't have to. It's subsidizing what they're you what they're what we're doing by using PFD cuts is to subsidize the top 20% non-residents and uh, oil companies uh, from, having to, from having to pay taxes. We're protecting them from having to pay taxes. And it, that's just not the best way to be doing it. That's not the best way to raise revenue. The best way, the lowest impact way, the best way for the economy is to spread the burden broadly and that makes it very thin, the thinnest it can be across the across the uh, across the economy and across across families. When you focus it just on one segment, which is what we're doing with PFD cuts, when you focus it just on middle and lower income Alaska Alaska families, it's not even reaching non-residents. When you focus it on them, it's a big burden. If we if we would even it out and spread it broadly. It would be much less of a burden, not only on lower and middle income Alaska families, but it'd be a fairly small burden, even on the top 20% and, and on non-residents and on and on the oil companies. It would be something of a burden that they don't have now because they're being subsidized by middle and lower income Alaska families, but it wouldn't be anywhere near the burden that's currently being felt by middle and lower income Alaska families using PFD cuts. We need to have that discussion. Those who continue to say spending cuts and holding their breath for spending cuts are just reinforcing those who want to use PFD cuts because we're not having the discussion about alternative revenues that would have a lower impact on the Alaska economy. They are those who are just, you know, holding on, holding their breath for spending cuts are just 
reinforcing the, the, the existing system of using PFD cuts because we're not having the discussion about alternatives and we're not having the discussion about why alternatives are better. So, you know, what, what, this, what this budget cycle again is demonstrating is we're not going to get there by cuts. As a practical matter, we're not going to get there by cuts. Even, even the Republicans, even the Valley Republicans, Delana is the co-chair of that committee, even the Valley Republicans are not stepping up to make the cuts that, that would be necessary to get the budget in balance through spending cuts only. And, and we need to face the reality that we that we need to at some point face the reality that that's not happening and we need to have a disc and we need then to start the discussion about what the best uh, revenue alternative is to, uh, to, to balance the budget instead. And just to put it in perspective, in case people think Brad is just, you know, being hyperbolic, um, <clears throat> I pulled it up because like I said, I'm known mathematician. But when we're talking about them only able to being able to cut 0.158% of the overall budget, that's the, that's the number. $3.155 billion and they cut $5 million. That's 0.158%. Ooh, man, they really worked themselves to the bone to get to that point. So for us to sit around out here and go cut the budget, cut the budget, cut the budget, and they're like, we did it. That's all we can do. 0.158%, sorry, uh, which you know will be eaten up in the supplementary budget and everything else. Oof. I mean, you know, Eskimo Libertarian just said, we need uh, we need Javier Malay uh, <clears throat> to get in there. Uh, with, with, who's the chainsaw guy from Argentina? He's the Libertarian president of Argentina who went in there. Literally, he walked around in the campaign with a chainsaw. I, I would not disagree, but we got to have the support of the people who are in there actually doing the work and good luck with that at this point. Um, so, I mean, Brad, the answer is everybody's got to pay. That's the thing. Since we can't control our appetite for spending, everybody should pay instead of just the lower and middle income. Or, or, or I mean, that's, that's the, that's the bottom line message here. Somebody's going to pay. Somebody's going to pay is the message. And the question is what's the best way to raise that revenue that has the lowest impact on the overall economy and has the lowest impact on Alaska families. It, it is, I mean, in all honesty, I've got friends in Oklahoma who are sort of chuckling at us because Oklahoma has an income tax and in Oklahoma and, and a number of some segment of the North Slope uh, are, are people who commute up from Oklahoma and work on the slope and then go back to Oklahoma and live in Oklahoma. They're paying income tax in Oklahoma on their Alaska income because Alaska doesn't have an income. So Oklahoma is being subsidized by Alaska, by Alaska not capturing a portion of the non-resident uh, that non-resident income for Alaska. It's being earned in Alaska. It's being taken in Alaska. It's being received in Alaska, but it's being taxed in Oklahoma. It's not like it's not being taxed being taxed in Oklahoma as opposed to being taxed in Alaska. We are subsidizing, Alaska is subsidizing Oklahoma by allowing Oklahoma to tax Alaska income instead of Alaska taxing Alaska income. If Alaska taxed the income, it would be deducted from the Oklahoma tax. The, the, the workers wouldn't care because they're going to pay the same tax regardless. It's just who they pay it to. My friends in Oklahoma just chuckle at us and say, thank you very much <laughs> because, <Yeah. clears throat> because, because you're helping to offset our deficits. Alaska is helping to offset our deficits down here. It is ridiculous the way that Alaska is raising revenue, the self-inflicted wound that Alaska is doing to itself in the way that we're raising, uh, raising revenue. And it... And we're not going to get there through spending cuts. I don't think es I don't think Eskimo Libertarian is wrong. We could use a Javier Malay. I mean, in this, uh, I mean, he he went in there and he is doing some amazing stuff. If you've been following that at all, uh, you should have some hope for the future. Although Argentina did have to sit in this malaise for twenty five years, they've been fighting this malaise down there. Uh, and especially after the crash in Argentina in 2001, 2002, it's been just a hot mess. But 
Maybe one day we'll get there, Brad. I don't know. I, I, See, I Michael, that, that's part of the problem to me. Part of the problem is thinking it's always going to happen. So we don't need to do anything. We just need to hold our breath and hang on until until it happens. Well, we got Dunleavy. In, in, we elected Dunleavy in 2018. Right. And he came in and he said he was going to do that. And he tried to do that in the 2019 session. And, and the tsunami overwhelmed him. He couldn't even get 16. At the end of the day, he couldn't even get 16 Republicans to stand up and uh, and and stand with him for the level of, of cuts that that he proposed and so it's as we sit here as we sit here and say all we need is all we need is all we every year we say that it's pfd cuts and pfd cuts and pfd cuts the top 20 percent are just going yeah yeah well we, yeah all we need are spending cuts they're saying that because they know it won't happen and they, but they know that putting it off another year will be another round of PFD cuts. And we'll discuss in, in the second segment, as, as you pointed out, we'll discuss in the segment, se- second segment. We now have people for just talking about eliminating the PFD entirely. It, it is, it, it, we've got to put a stake in the ground and say, let's have a discussion about how to pay for this. Every year that goes on is just another year of more PFD cuts, deeper and deeper and deeper PFD cuts. Um, and, and that and that's just the, the direction we go. If we don't have Republicans, if Republicans aren't willing to, to stand up and say, let's have a discussion about the best way to fund this. We know we're not going to be able to, to, to cut our way out of this. Let's have a discussion about the best way to fund, it, fund this. If we don't have that discussion, it's just going to be PFD cuts until the PFD is gone. And then, and then we'll have a discussion, <laughs> but well, but the yeah. PFD will be gone. And we know already. I mean, the numbers already prove this out. I mean, look at the OMB projections. Look at the, you know, look at the forecast for the last two or three years. Look at the forecast, the 10-year projections that they put out there. It's going to be gone, period. It They've already, I mean, you did the thing last week where you basically laid it out and said, here's. There's $55 million left if we pay a 2575 PFD. There's $55 million left, and they haven't even finished passing the bills this yet for, for the for the budget this year. It's over. Um, and Zach Fields talking about this massive new surplus that we could have, this $900 million surplus we could have if we just eliminated that pesky PFD. And, uh, and we'd have a surplus. And then he goes on to talk about spending the whole thing. <laughs> the whole thing. Exactly right. <laughs> This is my problem with this whole idea of, I mean, whether it's we get more money out of the oil companies, which you've said, you know, there's four or five hundred million dollars worth. Or even if we went with the billion dollars worth that Willikowski keeps talking about, you know, what would happen? We'd spend the whole thing. That's what would happen. That's that's exactly what's going on right now. We'd spend the whole thing and then go, oh, well, we need more because you guys are on a free ride and, you know, we still need more. That's what would happen. Because these guys have got no fiscal control. 0.158% cut out of a multi-billion dollar budget. And they're like, oh, man, that was a heavy lift. We just couldn't possibly do any more than that. I mean, it it's insane, Brad. It's insane. It is, it is Michael. And a big part of the problem, a big part of the problem is we've got a group of people, a very influential group of people, who don't have to pay for anything. I mean, Zach Fields is, is one of them. We've got people who don't have to pay, and so they don't care how much is being spent yeah. until they get tagged with a part of it. No change is going to happen. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're working on the weekly top three. Number two is a doozy. Number two is a doozy. This is the opinion piece from Zach Fields, who is the uh, legislator that represents uh, uh, South Anchorage, I don't know, Anchorage, uh, one of the more, one of the more, uh, uh, one of the lowest income sections of uh, of the whole state, uh, quite honestly, but especially Anchorage. And he's got this uh, opinion piece where he promotes this utopian society of we would just take care of everything. Um, and I am just absolutely blown away uh by this by this idea that he puts out there that somehow this is going to fix everything and only if you just gave the government all their money would society move forward it is literally a 
it is literally an endorsement of the narrative that the only way society can move forward was is with the direct benevolent intervention of government. Brad, I'll let you take it away from there. Well, for those who haven't read it, it's an opinion piece in the uh, in the ADN that ran uh, on March fifth uh, last uh, last Tuesday. If you want to if you want to look it up, if you haven't read it, and and it gives me it le- it left me with this impression. You know how you know when we have snow and ice, everything the roads are slick, and you don't have snow tires, you don't have studs, and you're getting to the top of the hill and you're having to slow down because there's traffic ahead of you. And you start sliding backwards <laughs> and, and you can't stop it. You just start sliding backwards and you keep going and you keep going and you keep going and you're picking up speed as you, as you go down. That's what, that's what this op-ed reminds me of that, that we've started sliding backwards with, uh, with PFD cuts. We started sliding backwards in 2017, well, 2016 under, under governor Walker. And then 2017 with the legislature, we started sliding backwards uh, down uh, down the hill in terms of PFD cuts, and we're picking up speed, picking up speed, and picking up speed. And Zach Fields' editorial op-ed is basically, let's just go ahead and plunge all the way down. Let's go ahead and and take out the uh, take out the remainder of the um, uh, take out the remainder of the of the PFD. It is um, it's it's replete with. He's talking about wiping out the PFD, right? What what could be done if we just wiped out the PFD and made it all government money? To put the scale of this expenditure in context, eight hundred eighty-one million dollars would be enough to build multiple new dams in the rail belt, replace dozens of rural communities' diesel-dependent power with cheaper renewable energy, and develop Cook Inlet gas to fix the pending heating shortage. I had I had to laugh at this so hard. I'm like. You're going to build multiple dams for eight hundred and eighty-one million dollars. Have you even looked at the price of a new dam? I mean, I'm just asking. A small dam, a micro dam. It's. I mean, show me something that you could build for less than a billion dollars. We're going to build multiples of them. We're going to do. I mean, this is this is fantasy. This guy is like he should be a Nebula Award-winning science fiction writer. This is some bull right here. Is what this is. This is some full-on Bert Stedman. That was just BS. But it, but it goes on. <laughs> or I'd, I'd say, or if we used our roughly eight hundred eighty-three million surplus on a combination of energy and education, we could have class sizes of 15 students or fewer for the entire state and make transformational investments to deliver cheap energy, all without establishing any new taxes. It, it is Zach Fields. I mean, we, we talk about Zach Fields being a representative from, from Midtown and, and, and North Anchorage. He's really not. But let's be honest. Zach Fields is a representative from the unions. He works for the unions, just like people, you know, picked at. Kevin Meyer and 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 Peter Machetti Machecki, uh, when they voted for oil taxes because they worked for the oil companies. Well, Zach Union works for Fields, or Zach Fields works for unions. There we go, and and it, it's that's his constituency. That's who he's representing, and his proposal is simply just to take all the money and turn it into to state funding, build it up with additional teachers, build it up with additional you know state run. Uh, uh, investment projects, state-run construction projects, just just consume it, consume it that way. Benefit his constituents by consuming it that way. Yes, it would hurt the people who vote for him, uh, uh, the middle and lower income Alaska families in his district. But he doesn't care. It it's what benefits the 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 unions and what benefits his true constituency, the people who truly put him in office now that we have unfunded or unlimited campaign funds. Um, it, that's, you know, that's his true constituency and that's, and that's who he's appealing to, but we're sliding, sliding that direction, Michael. We, yes, we did the, we did the program last week about, you know, that, that we've got a bare surplus uh, at POMB 2575, given the current amount of spending that goes away in two or three years. It, once we go through, once we go below POMB twenty five seventy five, it's not going to be long before people say, "Oh, the PFD is too small to really matter anymore. Uh, let's just go ahead and take the rest of it and turn it into government funding." We'll we'll say we have a surplus for a couple of years, but then just like the the savings accounts that we had in the early twenty teens, we'll just consume it by more and more and more spending, and it'll be gone. 
and that's and and we're and we're on that direction. There's 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 no gripping point as we slide backwards down the mountain. There's no gripping point uh, at which at which we stop this if we don't go to a funding mechanism, a revenue mechanism that's more broad based and include the top 20 percent uh, as part of the as part of the funding base. As long as they don't have skin in the game, they don't care. They'll go along with Zach Field's right. uh, uh, approach of continuing to spend it uh, on government. <laughs> well, I, I mean, his whole his whole his whole talk here again about uh, a robust economy. And again, it's so blatantly clear when he's talking about a robust economy, he's talking about the government economy. That's what he's talking about. And, and and he even mocks people in here. I don't know a single family that can uh, pay for their heating increases with their PFD. I don't know anyone who could pay for their rising heat bill with a PFD. And I'm like, are you kidding me? What do you think we use our PFDs for? We use it for, you're talking about that car going up the thing, and then we start sliding back. We put tires on our cars for years with PFDs. We paid for heating oil with PFDs. We did all those kind of things. And it, it it's it is a total fiction and a fantasy what he's portraying right here. And like you said, the only people that benefit are the unions, the government contractors, the private companies that are that are on the government teat, and 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 the and the private and the public economy. That's all that benefits from his vision. And, and here's the stair step that's going on. I mean, the PFD should be over three thousand dollars, right? And yes, people would do a lot. If they had three thousand dollars, they would be able to fill their, pay for their energy. They would be able to put new uh, new tires on their cars. They would be able to start businesses as 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 my friend has done with by saving for PFDs over the years. They would be able to do all these things um, uh, with uh, uh, with the uh, if, if we kept the PFD at the at at at, at the at, at its level at its statutory level. But as we've cut the PFD, it's less able to do those things. So what Zach is now doing is he's leveraging off that and saying, well, the PFD's gotten so small that it no longer fills your tank or it no longer fills your oil tank or it no longer puts tires on the car or it no longer does that. So we don't, we really shouldn't care about the PFD anymore because it's not big enough to do that anymore. And it's just, it's this maybe backwards stair steps. Maybe that's the way to do the right analogy or, or as I started, maybe, you know, uh, going backwards down the, down the hill, uh, as you've started down with ice, but as the PFD gets smaller and smaller, as they cut it and make it smaller and smaller, you're going to have more and more of these arguments because it's no longer significant enough to have that sort of impact on the family. I I always use the analogy of the cake, right? I mean, it's a big, beautiful chocolate cake or whatever cake you love if you don't like chocolate. Beautiful chocolate cake. And they came in and they consumed all but this little slice. And they're like, you're not going to eat that, are you? I mean, that's good, but you're not going to eat that, are you? I mean, you don't really need that, right? Because it's just not very much. So we'll go ahead and take that from you. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. I mean, that that's exactly, it's exactly where we're at right now. And and just the, I, I'm speechless right at this point, just looking at this. I mean, reading this article, and I'm going to trust me, I'm going to break this article down in the next segment. We're going to go through it uh, paragraph by paragraph to look at just how ridiculous this is. But this is just a prime example, uh, you know, of this utopian society. And Rob said it best, the same kind of paradise, kind of like that paradise in Venezuela. I mean, it seems like that's what Zach is proposing. He's proposing a Venezuela type, uh, you know, Venezuela North or whatever. Oh, if we just did all these things and took care of all these things, you'd be happy. Boy, Venezuela looks really happy. North Korea looks really happy. These places look really happy. And that's the kind of stuff he's tried to portray to here. But Michael, here's let's put segment one, and segment two together. Here's the deal. The, the even the Republicans aren't cutting spending enough to get us out of this debacle by spending cuts alone. There has to be some revenue offset in order to balance the budget. If we don't have a discussion about what the best alternative revenue is going to be, we're going to continue to have PFD cuts, and we're and we're and we're walking right into this 
this utopia that Zach's talking about. Every year we take a little bit more of the PFD and then we say, oh, there's not much left. We might as well take the rest of it. It's just, it's, we're, we're getting worse and worse. We're, we're stepping down lower and lower and lower and lower in the scale. And it's not going to stop. I mean, I'm, in, in the third segment, I'm going to talk about the revenue forecast that we're going to see later this week come out from, uh, come out from uh, the Department of Revenue. It's not going to stop. We're going to continue sliding backwards down this hill. And, and as long as we do it through PFD cuts, <laughs> we're going to continue to be taking it from middle and lower income Alaska families. And we're going to continue to walk right into this, this future that, that Zach Fields is talking about. We're doing it to ourselves by not having a discussion about alternative ways of doing it. The combination of all this stuff, like you said, connecting number one and number two is just, I mean, it's mind blowing. We can't possibly cut any more. And what we really need is just more, M-O-A-R, more. We just need more. Um, and if we had more, then everything would be perfect. But we know from experience that if they did have more, they would just spend more and then be looking for more. I mean, this is just a never ending cycle of insanity is what it is. It is Michael. It, it is. And, and we're triggering it. I mean, we've triggered it since 2016 and 2017 by allowing these, the, the revenue, allowing the revenues to come from a, be piled on just a very small part of the overall Alaska economy on middle and lower income Alaska families. And, and, and by not broad basing it, by not engaging the oil companies with a portion of it, not engaging the top 20% with a portion of it, not engaging the non-residents with a, with a portion of it by piling it on this small segment. Um, we've, we've just, we just, you know, we've allowed it to go on and we've allowed it to increase speed. And we've allowed the cut, PFD cuts to become deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper until the point that we've now reached the Zach Fields point of, ah, it's just not, as you say, with the cake, it's just not much left. Might as well take it all. And yeah. look what we could do with it all. Look, look yeah. what, look, look, look what my unions could yeah. do with it all. Exactly. You're not going to eat that, are you? I mean, that's not very much. That's just a tease. You don't need any of that. We'll take it. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine. I mean, you know, we'll take care of you. We'll take care of you from cradle to grave. We'll, we'll take care of your every need. You don't need to thought. And then we'll tell you where, go, where to go work and where to go do things. And where, cause you know, we know better than you, how this stuff should be done. So we'll just plan that out for you. And you'll just, I mean, it, it, it uh, just, I mean, it's, it's nuts. It is absolutely nuts. And, and this is going to be, this is going to be the one that's going to trigger a bunch of people, but it, but I've said it before and I'll say it again and I'll say it now. Those who are holding their breath for spending cuts are enabling this situation to go on and this situation to get worse because spending, we're not going to get there on spending cuts. Look at what the House Republicans have done with respect to the budget. As Michael said, 0.1, whatever it is, percent in, in terms of cuts. We're not going to get there on spending cuts. And so if we don't have a discussion about a broader based revenue system, a system that triggers, has the oil companies with, a, with skin in the game, has the top 20% with skin in the game, has the non-residents, non-resident industries with, uh, with uh, 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 skin in the game. If we don't trigger a broader base pushback on spending, uh, we're just going to keep, we're just going to continue sliding on down. We're just going to continue to get had that slice of cake be smaller and smaller and smaller until until it's gone. So I, I really I, I don't have I don't have much patience anymore for people who say spending cuts only because that's that's not a realistic solution. And all it does is facilitate continued PFD cuts. It puts off the discussion about revenues and it just leads to continued PFD cuts. It's the top 20 percent you know, then the oil company is Nirvana because they don't have to talk about contributing revenue. They just say, well, you know, look at, look at all these people who say spending cuts. Right. Yeah, we'll just focus on spending cuts. Yeah, we're doing fine. We don't have to, you know, pony up anymore, even though it's a fraction of what we're doing in other parts of the world. No big deal. We, we're doing fine. We're we, doing we, like fine. Sub, we like subsidizing Oklahoma. 
Yeah, we love subsidizing Oklahoma and other places. I mean, the fact that we're getting away, with, you know, again, we're missing four or five hundred million dollars in revenue there uh, and other places. I mean, again, we keep going back to the fiscal policy working groups plan. But I mean, that had a little bit of everything. Everybody hated it by the time it was. And that's the sign of a good piece of that's a sign of a good plan. Right. Where everybody hates a little bit of it. That's what we should be talking about. But of course, no, nobody wants to. It's been two, three years now. We haven't instituted one piece of that plan, eight or nine different parts, not one piece of that plan. Why? Well, because it would require discipline, and we don't want that at all. We don't want to be constrained at all. That's what they're looking at right now. Yep. We, we, we've got we've got our revenue source. We've got our preferred revenue source. Oh, P- and PFD cuts. Thank you very much. And as much as I'd like to see the, the permanent fund itself, you know, responding to the market and being up. I mean, I just dread the day that that thing hits 100 million, 100 billion dollars, because then they'll be like, oh, we don't need you anymore. We'll just keep we'll just keep rolling. We'll just keep rolling on our own steam. That's <clears throat> oh, it's just it's insanity. Absolute insanity. Brad Keithley, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three. Uh, my head is going to explode from the first two. The third one, I'm sure, will just be the icing on the cake that I will never eat because they'll take it all. Um, let's uh, let's talk about it, Brad. The projections from the DOR. What does it tell us, uh, especially compared to the to the other one, to the other to the other two? Give give us give us the rundown here. All right. So this week, sometime or maybe if the if the if revenue for some reason slides it over. Um, this week sometime we're due to have the spring revenue forecast come out and there's a lot of, uh, discussion about the legislature sort of putting off finalizing budgets or pushing forward on budgets until they see the spring revenue forecast, because they want to make sure they're dealing with the latest numbers before they, before they push forward. We keep track of, of oil futures and, and, and the, the factors that go into the spring revenue forecast. So I've got a fairly high confidence that I know what the, what the spring revenue forecast is going to look like. The oil price is going to be up a little bit. The, uh, the, the, the fall revenue forecast had FY 25. And what we're really focused on here is the FY 25, because that's the, that's the budget that the legislature is dealing with and that they're holding in abeyance pending getting the spring revenue forecast. The, uh, the fall, uh, uh, the fall forecast had oil prices, FY 25 oil prices at $76 and had traditional revenue, $76 a barrel and had traditional revenues at $2.65 billion. The, uh, the, the spring forecast, uh, is likely going to have oil at around $80, 79 to $80 up three to $4 from where the fall revenue forecast had it. And we'll have traditional revenues at roughly $2.83 billion compared to the 2.65 that was in the, uh, that was in the fall forecast. And so revenues are gonna be up about $150 million from the fall forecast. But let's put this in context. The revenues in F for projected for FY24, the current fiscal year that, we in, that we're in are $3 billion because production's higher. Even though, and, and because they forecast higher oil prices than the than were forecast for the FY uh, 25 budget, the FY 24 budget is is around 84 dollars a barrel. The the prices that are likely coming with the FY with the spring forecast will be 80 dollars a barrel, down four dollars from the FY 24 uh, budget uh, for the FY 25 budget. Production's going to be down. Also, production should be down. Also, we've had we've been underrunning uh, the uh, the the projections of uh, production for FY twenty four. The FY twenty uh, five project, uh, projections of production are down from FY twenty four. Since we've been underrunning FY twenty four, I suspect we're going to underrun the FY twenty five uh, projection that was in the fall revenue forecast. Also, and that should that'll be that should show up in the spring revenue forecast. So even though oil prices are going to be up from what they were projected in the uh, FY24 budget, revenues are going to be down uh, from the from the FY24 budget for uh, uh, for uh, for FY FY25. At the same time as we have that, 
we're seeing spending increase in FY25 because they think they've got a surplus, right? I mean, they're now treating the PFD as a surplus. So we've got $250 million layered on already for uh, K through 12 spending bills that have passed the uh, bill that's passed both bodies and, and sitting on the governor's desk. Um, we've got other spending increases. Uh, Julie, Julie Colomb's uh, uh, child care uh, spending increase that uh, that's increased spending on that side. So we've got we've got an FY24 forecast or an FY25 revenue forecast that's going to show a downward trend from FY20 from FY24. And we're and we're showing an FY25 uh, spending trend that's up from FY24. What does that do? That increases the deficit. So we're heading into a situation where, you know, additional PFD cuts, the draft budget that we've already seen or the draft analysis we've already seen of Senate finance says, ooh, we've got a $55 million surplus if we go to POMB 2575. I suspect that will go down uh, once they layer in the, the impact of the additional spending uh, that's going on. So it's <laughs> we're going to see headlines that are going to say oil prices up in the in the FY24 or FY25 well in the spring revenue forecast oil prices up for FY25 from where they were for FY24 but don't for from where they were in the fall revenue forecast but don't let that mislead you revenues are down because production volumes are down and because the FY25 projected oil price was going to be down from FY24 uh, in any event revenues are going to be coming down spending's going up Deficits are are going to be are going to be increasing uh, in FY24 over uh, what they were in in FY25 over what they were in FY24, and so PFD cuts. I mean, since that's the only revenue that we talk about, PFD cuts are going to be deeper in uh, in FY25 than they than they have been in even in FY24. And you're already seeing again putting together with what Zach Field said and with your number one, which was we can't cut anything anyway. That essentially means that twenty five seventy five, get it while it's good because <laughs> next time it'll be twenty eighty, or fifteen you know fifteen eighty five or ten and ninety. I mean, literally, that's where we're going. They will figure out what's left over, and we'll barely get that. Grudgingly, we will barely get a fraction of what you know we're supposed to get, and then they'll look at us and go, "Well, you know, your, your free ride is over." Essentially. <laughs> your free ride and this you you knew that was going to trigger me right i knew it you, i knew it <laughs> your free ride is over you middle and lower income alaska families your free ride is over but our top 20 percent oil companies and non-residents our free ride continues because we're taking the money that was due you and we're using it to pay the taxes we otherwise ought to pay and so our free ride where we don't have to pay for any of this government Government grows, but we don't have to pay for it because we're taking money from you to pay the taxes. Um, uh, our free ride continues. And I, that's, just, I mean, that's the that's the irony about all this. People talk about the free ride of, of the PFD, but that's not the big free ride. The big free ride is to the top 20%, the oil companies and the non-residents who don't have to pay taxes. And, and all PFD cuts are doing is making sure that free ride continues. In any event, the FY, the, the, the spring revenue forecast that we're going to see later this week or early next is, is going to be, the headlines are going to say, oh, oil price is up a little bit. Um, uh, isn't that great? Well, it's not because they're up a little bit from a projection of a decline uh, uh, in any event from uh, FY24. The Production volumes are likely going to be down in FY25 from FY24, and likely going to be down even from the fall from the fall revenue forecast. And spending's up, and so deficits deficits are growing, even with a, a slight blip up in oil prices from where they were in the fall revenue forecast. Deficits are going to be growing. <laughs> Couple this. Couple this, Brad, with the ten-year outlook from the governor's office from the from the OMB, and look at—I mean, just just you know, plug those numbers into his last forecast uh, in his last ten-year projection. 
I mean, what do you think? I mean, give me a give me a put your Kreskin turban on here and look into your crystal ball and tell me what do you think? Twenty four months, thirty six months, the dividend is zeroed out at that point. I mean, they're already talking about it here, right? They're, he's talking to, he's saying the quiet part that they would have never said five years ago out loud, and now he's saying we need to take the whole PFD to pay for all this wonderful state government. Uh, and you didn't really need that anyway, because you couldn't really pay for anything with that thousand bucks. I mean, again, ignoring the fact that most it's a family of four, generally speaking, and I don't know about you, but $4,000 is real money to me. If it was four family of four and it was a thousand bucks a piece, that's real money. Uh, you know, for me anyway, maybe not if you're making $167,000 a year, plus your regular full-time job, maybe 4,000 doesn't mean squat to you, but to me, that's real money. But, you know, they're they're already seeing it. So what do you think? 36 months? <laughs> well, we're we're already seeing Zach. I mean, we're already seeing Zach press for taking the rest of the PFD. And and while you and I believe have 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 always thought of Zach as a marginal player, what what Zach says is exactly what's happening. What he said three years ago is, or four years ago is we ought to cut the PFD in order to fund government. You and I you know, said that's a horrible thing. Shouldn't be doing that. There's ways to, there's ways to cut spending yet. Where are we? We've cut the PFD. We haven't cut spending. The house Republicans are saying they can't cut spending. Um, and, and we're just, we're sliding backwards down this hill. And, and Zach's now saying, Zach's now saying, just take the rest of the PFD. Look at all the glorious things we can do by taking the rest of the PFD and you don't really need that PFD. You don't, you don't really need that, 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 that minor, times. that minor amount. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and yes, we want to scoff at it. And yes, we want to say Zach's a marginal player, but that's where, you know, he's been the forerunner in terms of where this thing's going. And, and, you know, as long as the top 20% oil companies and non-residents don't have to contribute to government costs, they're, that's where it's going to continue to go. So I, I don't know, Michael, maybe, maybe 36 months is maybe we get a little bit more than 36 months out of it, but it's, but, but we are going down this hill and we're gaining speed as we're going backwards down this hill. Yeah, and there is a, there is a crash, a big crash. There, again, the bridge is out and we're like, Oh, wait a minute. Don't what? No, hold my beer. Here's the shovel. Just keep shoveling, baby. We'll be spectacular. If this state didn't, if this state, I'm assuming is what Brian was trying to say. If this state didn't have a PFD, this show would be pretty skinny on topics. Oh, man, we could dive into so many other things if we didn't have to focus on this, Brian. I mean, if we didn't have to focus on this, we could talk about a lot of different stuff. But, yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's just, it's, and Herder kind of sums up a lot of the problems. Don't know if I could afford retirement here. I think that's, a, you know, there's a lot, and there's a lot of people in the legislature. They, they, they have already made that decision. So they don't care what they do now. They will increase their salaries by 67% to make sure that when they leave here, they take some of that money with them. That's what they're looking at. They're already making decisions. Uh, based on that, knowing that they are not here for the long term, whatever they can get now, they're going to get. Um, and uh, that's I mean, that that's 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 it right there. Um, all right, Brad, I'm I just don't even know what to say at this point. I really I really don't. I'm going to get into the Zach Fields piece in the next segment, but I guess I'll give you your thoughts here. Your final your time to sum eight and, and final thoughts when it's all said and done here. Give it to me. Michael, we've got to we've got to have a discussion about revenues. We've got to have a discussion about revenues. There, there. I mean, we do have we do have revenues. We do have taxes. PFD cuts are taxes. And and if we don't have a discussion about better alternatives, lower impact. I mean, we've got people we've got people who go around and say, I'm you know I'm focused on the economy. That's that's all I care about. We have to have a strong economy because. Because that's what that's what's going to retain people here. That's what's going to bring additional people up. I'm all about the economy. Great. PFD cuts have the largest adverse of any of the revenue options. PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact uh, on the economy. ICER in 2016, and if you look at the numbers, it still is true today. There's two factors that go into that. One is that, that PFD cuts take revenue only from Alaskans. Non-residents don't contribute. 
and it it is the most regressive form of taxation, which takes money out of middle and lower income Alaska families who are the ones who spend all of their all of their income uh, on on living, spend all of the, most of their income in Alaska. Um, and and those two factors continue are, are long term. So PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on the economy. we got people running around saying, oh, I'm all for the economy on the one hand. And then they say, but I'm for people, but I want to pay for all this through PFD cuts. You can't be for both. If you're for PFD cuts, you're for hurting the economy. You're for you're for a system, a revenue system that has the largest adverse impact on the overall uh, Alaska economy. That's it, it's simple. It's straightforward. It's the numbers. It's what the Excel spreadsheet will tell you. That's what that's what is happening. And yet they go around saying, well, I'm all for the economy. If we don't have a discussion about alternative revenues, if we don't have a discussion about different ways to fill these budget holes that are going to continue because we can't cut spending, if we don't have a discussion about different about different revenues, then we're just going to continue hurting the economy. We're going to continue sliding down the hill. And when we get to the bottom of the hill, yeah, maybe people won't be able to retire here anymore. It's just, I, 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 I am frustrated as I'm sure a lot of people are, but I'm frustrated by the fact we just don't even have the discussion. Ben tried, Ben Carpenter tried in House Ways and Means. He brought up sales taxes, not the perfect option because they're still regressive, but they're a heck of a lot better than, than PFD cuts. And he couldn't even get it out of committee. Couldn't even get the support to get it out right. of committee. Right. And I, and I just, I, if we don't discuss these things, if we don't move them forward, if we don't try to figure out a better way of dealing with the situation we're in, we're going to end up with a huge adverse impact on the economy, a huge adverse impact on middle and lower income Alaska families. We've got to have that discussion. And yeah, maybe, you know, maybe we wouldn't be discussing this if we didn't have the PFD, but this state would be a lot different without the PFD. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> Cindy says, Hard to grow, hard to not grow weary in well doing when the needle doesn't seem to be moving. And and I, I feel you, Cindy. I feel you. That's why that's been my exhortation is to not grow weary in well doing because that's that's what they're doing. They're wearing us down. They're grinding us down. Right. They're they're doing what they want to do. If we keep getting stuck on just the <clears throat> the cut side when they're obviously not doing it, we need to start talking about changing our tactics. Um, but you're right. It's hard to not just throw your hands up in the air and say, I'll get mine. And when the going gets tough, I'll just move out because there's nothing left. I'll go to some free state like Texas or Florida or someplace where they don't have all these taxes. And I got more people who are more fiscally like minded than, than they've got here. That's just, you know, that's what's going to happen. That's, you know, that's what's going on right now. People are going to move out. Kids are moving out. My oldest daughter lives in Florida with her husband. Why? Well, a lot of the reasons we talked about here, uh, I'd love to see them here, but they, they're doing much better down there than they could do here. And that's a sad, sad state of affairs. That's, that's a sad state of affairs right there. Um, it is, we don't, we don't, we don't have, <laughs> we don't have much of a private economy. Uh, I mean, we have, we have the oil companies. That's about it. The oil companies and the spinoffs. That's about it. We don't have, we don't have the small businesses building small businesses um, because we tax them. I mean, we tax middle and lower income Alaska families, the people who put together those small businesses and we tax them heavily. And it's just, we're, we're doing it wrong. We're, we're just doing our, our fiscal system. We're doing our state wrong. And, and we're not even having a discussion about how to do it better. Brad Keithley, Alaska's for sustainable budgets. Brad, thank you so much. Uh, appreciate you coming on board. We will uh, talk with you again next week. The beating shall continue. All right. Michael, as always, <laughs> thanks for having me. We appreciate you. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3. <laughs>